Um, okay. I'm going to talk about family. First of all, I want to say I was raised in a beautiful family. I was raised in a God-fearing family by parents who are wonderful example to me. I had a mother and father, an older sister and an older brother, and the family was formed as a God-fearing unit, and we were church-going people, and basically I couldn't have wanted for our better parents. I learned the love and grace of Jesus Christ at my mother's knee. I didn't need any more instruction than that, although when I came to understand myself, what the Bible had as its message, that then became my guide, but my parents did a wonderful job in um, directing us toward the way of life. I grew up in Christ. I got baptised when I was about 19. And I saw in my family some of the greatest examples that I can think of that point us toward the love that God and Jesus have for us. I saw in my parents, as close as I would get on this earth, a perfect marriage. They weren't perfect, but at the same time, they did a wonderful job of representing the relationship that God has for his people. God has styled himself as the husband, first of Israel, then secondly of spiritual Israel. <clears throat> and I saw in my mum and dad, as close as I could see on earth, a relationship which reflected the love that God has for his wife and for his bride. And that was something which was really, really wonderful. But it also showed me that there was a feedback system at work, that you can have a look at a relationship which is a marriage relationship here on earth, and that will give you some small insight as to what God must be feeling for us. But then you look at God and his relationship with his people, and that directs us back to how to make our marriage more perfect. And so you end up with a feedback loop. Our marriage points um, ever so imperfectly toward the relationship that God has with his bride. And then that relationship of God and his bride feeds back that we might be take that and help our marriages grow even more perfect in the representation of God and his bride. And I saw in my dad and my mum, I guess almost the perfect parents. Not perfect, but they were wonderful parents. They were good to me and they were good to my brother and sister. And again, I saw in that the example of the fathership of God and how God looks upon us as his children and how Jesus is our brother. And again, it was a feedback loop. I look at it and I can say, there was the example of my parents loving us. I could see that that was a tiny example of how God loves us. But then the perfect love that God gave to us reflects back into our family that we can make the fatherhood and motherhood in our lives even more perfect. And so that feed feedback loop was set up again so that all of us strive to be as close as we can to the love of God. And so that was a family I grew up in. Um, I went up to university. I was baptised when I was about 19 years old, gave myself to Jesus, went along to church activities, went to the youth groups, met a girl there and married when I was 23. And when we married, we uh, after a couple of years, we went off to live in the Fijian Islands for two years doing mission work. And we came back and we bought a one and a half thousand acre property at Bathurst, which is just about 200 kilometres west of Sydney. <clears throat> where we raised cattle and pigs and goats. I'm not too sure whether we ran them or they ran us. But whatever it was, after five years, unfortunately, my marriage broke down. My wife left and she decided she'd rather be a party girl than a wife. So after 11 years, um, she left me with the kids and off she went. And so I suddenly found myself a single parent. Um, and I guess this was the first time I sort of understood that all of the things my parents had shown me were not going to be reflected in my life. And I found that against what I wanted or what I needed or what I thought I needed, I found myself alone with my three children. They were four, seven and ten. So I had to come back to Sydney. We sold up everything we had and I came back to Sydney and with great help from my parents and my sister, um, I raised the kids for the next three years, but I was totally aware always that 
that beautiful symbol that my parents had set, which pointed towards the love that God had for his bride, was not reflected in my life. <clears throat> and I suppose with a bit of self-pity, my mind always went to Isaiah 49, verse 25, which says, Can a woman forget her sucking child that she should have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, yet I will not forget you. And that really came home to me because here was a woman who decided that she'd walk away from her family and ever since has. She went to live in America for 10 or 15 years and has come back and sees her kids now, but is totally possessed by what she's doing herself. And I felt that I'd failed somehow as a husband because the whole relationship had fallen to pieces. <clears throat> then after 10 years, I remarried and we had two more children, two more sons. My first two sons were called Joshua and Benjamin. And then from my second marriage, we thought that's enough Hebrew. So we'll have a little bit of Irish Catholic. So we had a Paddy and a Mick. <laughs> so with the next marriage, we worked together and um, she was also a Christian, a Christian who'd been converted by myself. She hadn't been a Christian beforehand, but she had come in to the Lord. But after 13 years, that marriage failed as well. And I found myself unbelievably married twice and divorced twice. And I thought, I, I, I can't get further away from the example that God left for us. Two failed marriages, two divorces. Where was the example of the husband and the father that um, should have been in my life? And it wasn't. And then I began to realise that now there's lots of people who don't have that example in their life. There are lots of people who find that the relationships that they wanted with their children or with their husband or their wife didn't work out the way they wanted, didn't work out the way God planned for all of us to be. But that's where we find ourselves. And I often thought of the symbols of God as our, first of all, husband. How many people must find that so hard to relate to? How many women are terrified of their husbands? Their husbands come home drunk and abusive. And as we would say in Australia, belt the tripe out of their wife. How many women with abusive husbands who sexually abuse them or physically abuse them, how do they look at God as a husband of his people? And how many children are terrified of their fathers? How many children are terrified when the father comes home drunk, whether he's going to abuse them, beat them up, or worse, sexually abuse them? And I thought, now there are so many times when people can't relate to those images. And so I thought to myself, almost all of us will be in this position at some stage. Doesn't mean to say the perfect image that God gave us is any way diminished. It is there and it is perfect. But I will shortly um, give a suggestion as a way we might, if we do find it difficult to relate to a father or a husband, a way we might be able to get around that. First of all, why is it that God chooses sometimes to style himself as a husband and then sometimes as a father? If you look in the Old Testament, it's almost always God has pitted himself as the husband. He took Israel out of Egypt and brought them to Sinai and there they exchanged their wedding vows. At Sinai, God promised exactly as every husband does. He promised, I will look after you, I will feed you, I will clothe you, I will house you, I will protect you. I will make sure that you get every gift that I can give you. And that was what God promised to Israel. And he only asked one thing in return, only one thing, that was fidelity. That's all he asked. And God set that up with Israel. <clears throat> and as you go through the Old Testament, that is the most common relationship. Not the only one. God does call himself the Father as well, but not as often. And then we come to the New Testament, we find the role is totally reversed. We find that suddenly it's the parent-child relationship 
It's Jesus who says, call our Father in heaven, our Father. We don't pray by saying, our husband in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We pray to our Father in heaven. Again, it's not that there isn't the relationship of a husband and wife. Ephesians 5 is full of that. And the last chapters of Revelation is all about the preparation of the bride of Christ. So why is there such a difference between the two? And I think one reason for that is that the husband-wife relationship is a collective relationship. When God talks about his church or when God talks about his people, he collectively calls him his wife. It was Israel who was gathered together and it was Israel who became the wife of God. It was Israel who was wooed. It was Israel that was forgiven after she was an adulteress. And that was because it was a collective group. And when you come to the New Testament, you have exactly the same relationship. Christ and the church is what's figured in a marriage. And when you come to the very end of Revelation, it is Jesus Christ who takes the collective believers and they become his wife. But in a one-to-one -one relationship, it's the parent relationship. The father, the father's personal. The father is the one that relates personally to us. And on a one-to-one -one relationship, that's the relationship that we have. And so we look back at all of the relationships in our life. And as I said, I probably can't believe that my relationship has turned out to be the way it has. Two marriages, two divorces. It would seem that everything you could think of to make the parallel with God has fallen to pieces in my life. And as I've said many times before, I'm sure that I've made plenty of mistakes. Not too sure my kids made mistakes at four, seven and ten that caused them to lose their mother. But at the same time, that's the position I found myself in. And I, as I said, I think of so many people who find ourselves in this position. And what are people who have never had these relationships? Not that these relationships might have gone bad, but what about people who never had them? What of men and women who have never married? How do they understand the relationship of a husband and wife when they read Ephesians 5? How do they relate to something they've never experienced? And how about people who have never had children? How do they understand the relationship of the father and the child, of the parent and the child? And it always seemed to me that there's got to be something else that God's provided. And it is. There's a third relationship which every single one of us can have. And unlike the other two, it's not a permanent relationship. If you look at the relationship of a parent and a child, you can't break that relationship. Once you're born, you've got your parents. There's nothing you can do about it. And the parents got the children and there's nothing they can do about it. And if that relationship becomes abusive and often it becomes abusive, the children abuse the parents. Often we think, well, it's the father who might come home drunk or it's the parents that might abuse the children. But in this day and age, I think there is almost as much abuse by children of their parents, particularly financial abuse. When the parents get old and can't reorganise really their affairs and children steal from them. So people, where those relationships are broken down, what can we do? I'm going to just read a passage out of John 15, and you'll probably know it. But I find this totally beautiful because this is a relationship which isn't set in stone. This is a relationship which is a choice. You know, often we might get married when we're 23, and when we're 60, we look at our spouse and think, well, it's not quite what I thought. But this relationship is a beautiful relationship that I love. John 15 and verse 13. Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. There's a relationship that isn't fixed. It's a relationship of choice. I choose to be friends with Jesus. And that old hymn, 
What a friend we have in Jesus comes home to me because that's a relationship that we have to sustain and can sustain every day. And every one of us knows what a good friend is. Every one of us knows that God and Jesus are our total friends. And whatever mess we might have in our life, we do know that the friendship of Jesus is everlasting. Thanks.